Good morning, everyone. I hope that uh, I hope that your walk with Christ has been fruitful for this week. And we're going to be back in the book of Hebrews. Actually, today we're going to finish up the big book of Hebrews. Hopefully, I know it's been a while, and we've been going through this book for a while. But it's been such a man. This uh, study in Hebrews has been so fruitful for us, and so we're in this last chapter, chapter 13, and uh, we're beginning to deal with all these imperatives. Remember, we've been saying for the last couple of weeks that um, the author or the writer of Hebrews is presenting to us, has been presenting to us for uh, 12 chapters, basically all of the doctrines of grace, right? All of those things uh, that tell us or explain to us how our relationship works uh, with God uh, through Christ's sacrifice. And so now we're in chapter 13 and the writer begins to kind of give us all of these, uh, what we call imperatives in the Greek, or you could just say commands, or you could say these things that we're supposed to do. Uh, this, this way in which we are uh, to respond uh, to what we believe. And so this is what we've been studying uh, for the last couple of weeks. And this is where we're going to end uh, today, right? We've been looking at this list of imperatives in chapter 13, or we could say this manner of living, right? This uh, Christian or Christ-like conduct that begins to identify us with Christ. And remember, it's not just this Christ-like attitude um, that manifests itself on the outside or what you could say, uh, what we present to the world, but it's this Christ-like attitude that begins to manifest itself on the inside, right? What we believe by faith in the inner man. And so uh, the whole idea is that, that there is this response in the inner person, right, that begins to transform the way, remember, God, he cares about how you think, There's a way that begins to transform the way that you think or your thoughts, and it begins to transform uh, your affections. That's the whole point. If you look at verse 1, I'm just going to go down through this chapter briefly to kind of reorient ourselves, and then we'll look at our verses. But if you look at verse 1, right, uh, this this response in the inner person, right, should cause us uh, to continue to love the brethren in verse 1, he says, uh, that we are not neglecting to show hospitality to strangers uh, in verse 2, that we are remembering the ill-treated, right, and the prisoners, he says uh, in verse 3, that we are honoring marriage, that we are rejecting sexual immorality, right? And the reason that we're beginning to respond this way is because in salvation, we now have the character and nature of Christ in us. And so we begin to reflect the one who is in us, right? Remember, the proof of faith is love, and the proof of love is obedience. Remember, Jesus is the one that told us, right, that, that wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. In other words, right, you're going to begin to love what you treasure. And if you treasure Christ, you're going to be, uh, again, to love and treasure uh, what he says. You're going to be, uh, again, to love and treasure, right, all of those things of God. And so this is why the writer says to us in verse 5, look at it. He says, make sure that your character or your manner of living or your way of life is free from the love of money. Or you could even add to that, like we have been, that anything, right, make sure that your character is free from the love of anything, right, that gets in the way of your relationship with Christ, that that threatens to steal your affection uh, for Christ. He says, and be content with what you have. There's also a response in the inner person that begins to believe and trust Christ. We saw that in verses five and six. If you look at it, it says, for Jesus has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, right? Verse six, so that we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, Uh, what can man do to me? And the reason that we we begin to trust uh, Christ, the reason that we begin to trust his word comes to us in verse eight, uh, because he tells us, right, that Christ, he never changes, right? That Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Remember, the writer of Hebrews isn't giving us all of these imperatives, all of these commands because they're easy. He's giving us all these things because they're hard, right? They're hard uh, to do, right? It's going to be hard to love the unlovable. It's going to be hard uh, to put yourself out there for strangers. It's going to be hard to suffer or to be ill-treated, right? It's going to be hard. Uh, it's going to be hard to remain unpolluted by the world, right? 
right? We already know this by experience. We're constantly guarding our minds and our hearts. And so this is why the writer of Hebrews reminded us that these commands are going to require, right, an inner strength, this inner strength from God. Look at verse 9. He says, Do not be carried away with varied and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace. This was the context of, of what we talked about last week, right? Remember, we talked about the fact that being strengthened by grace means that we understand and are trusting in the things that Christ has already accomplished for us, right? That we have been united to Christ in his death and resurrection by faith, right? That we can no longer be separated from the love of God forever. That there is no more condemnation for us who are in Christ Jesus. That there is no more punishment, right? That there is no wrath of God that is against us. Uh, That our citizenship is now in heaven, or as Peter puts it, right? That we have an inheritance which is imperishable, it's undefiled, and it cannot fade away, and it is reserved in heaven for you right now. Those are the things that we trust and believe in, right? Those are the things that, that Christ has already accomplished for us, and these are the things that strengthen us, right? That's what it means to be strengthened by grace. That all of this is by the grace and mercy of God alone, which causes us to see the glory and majesty of Christ. That's the whole point. It changes the way that we see uh, the Word of God. It changes the way that we see the world, right? That there is no sacrifice that we can make. That was the writer's whole point for the last 12 chapters, that there is no sacrifice that we can make that can improve on our right standing with God other than the one that Christ already made for us or the one that Christ already offered on the cross. It is done. It is finished. It is complete. Look at verse 15, he says, through Christ then, right? That's the whole point of all this. Through Christ then, if you understand all of these things, through Christ then it causes us, right, to let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That's our sacrifice, that we are praising and worshiping God. That is uh, the fruit of lips that give thanks uh, to his name. That's what it causes us to do. And so, as I mentioned last week, just briefly, but what we're going to talk about this morning is that there is another source of strength for you and me. There's another source of strength for the church, and that is the leadership of the church, right? That we are strengthened, right, by grace through the Word of God. We saw that, that we are strengthened uh, by the body of believers. We saw that, that we are strengthened by the Holy Spirit of God. But the writer of Hebrews also tells us that we are strengthened by the leadership of the church, right? If you remember, the Apostle Paul made it clear uh, in Ephesians uh, that Christ's gift to the church was spiritual leadership. But let me read these verses. We're going to kind of split this up. Like I said, these are in sections, so we got to kind of take them in sections. We're going to look at verses 7 and 8, and then we're going to look at verses uh, 17 through 21, if you want to read with me here. The writer of Hebrews says, remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you and considering the result of their conduct, he says, imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now move to verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief for this would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a good conscience desiring to conduct conduct ourselves honorably in all things. And I urge you all the more to do this so that I may be restored to you the sooner. Verse 20. Now the God of peace who brought up the from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, um, help us this morning as we go through these things, uh, not only to have understanding, Father God, uh, it's, understanding is one thing, Lord, and uh, we know that, but we want this to be 
uh, sealed in our hearts. We want to be convinced of these things, Father God, not just uh, by our own doing. We know that our heart is already wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can trust it, Father? But we want the Holy Spirit of God to work through this this morning uh, in teaching us those things uh, that uh, we need to understand, those things that we believe, Father, those the, the reaffirming of, of the word of truth. And so this morning we are praying for perseverance and endurance. We are praying um, that we would see uh, the provision of Christ uh, for the church, Father God, that we would be comforted, that we would be confident, Father God, uh, that we would be hopeful through these things this morning. We thank you for your grace and mercy as we've talked about already this morning. Uh, and we praise you. And the, the fruit of our lips this morning is, Father, that uh, we love you and that we know you and that we see the value of Christ in his word. We thank you for all of these truths this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, so the New Testament makes it clear that one of the gifts that Jesus Christ gave uh, to the church upon his resurrection uh, was the gift, right, of, of leadership, spiritual leadership, that there will be some in the local assembly, right, uh, that have been set apart by the Holy Spirit to equip and to lead the church. This is the way Paul puts it in Ephesians. Right? He says, and Christ gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, he says. In other words, Christ is appointed, right, spiritual leadership uh, for the strengthening and the endurance of the body of Christ, right? And one of the main themes that we've been looking at in the book of Hebrews all along is this theme of endurance and perseverance, right? That perseverance and endurance is is super profitable for the soul, as you can imagine, right? That we uh, continue. Uh, remember the writers, I put a couple of the verses, remember the writers' admonition back in verse 10. He's telling these believers, these Hebrew believers, right? For you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. And he also said in chapter 10, but we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but those who have faith to persevering of the soul. And so that's the whole point, right? That is that we persevere and that we endure. And the idea here is that one of the means that Christ uses to strengthen the believers, listen to me now, to strengthen the believers are pastors, elders, overseers, shepherds, right? Who are tasked uh, to lead the saints, right? That they not only are that not only are the saints commanded to follow these leaders, right, to imitate their faith, but that they are also commanded to obey their leaders because it is profitable uh, for their souls, the writer of Hebrews says, okay? In other words, Jesus Christ is ordained, right, that he will mediate much of his rule uh, through uh, leaders of the church. This is what the Bible tells us, right, that God's order of authority includes the leadership, right, of the local assembly. Remember, Scripture makes it clear that Christ is the head of the church, right? That Christ is the head of the church, that he is the great shepherd, that he is the chief shepherd, right? And those who lead the local church or overseers of the church, they are his under shepherds. Those are the, the definitions, right? That there are shepherds, that there are elders, that there are overseers, right? You'll even see the word bishop in there. But understand that all of those words are interchangeable, right? There's no one specific office that is elevated above the other. They are all spiritual leaders of the church. And the primary role of the under shepherd in the body of Christ, as we saw in Ephesians, is to equip the body of Christ for the work of service and to the building up of the body of Christ. That is their role. Or you could say their role role is for the strengthening of the church or to cause you to endure. That's what they do. That's what their role is. But the question becomes for us, and this is one of the things I wanted to discuss this morning because this is one of the questions I get the most. You'll notice I'm going to talk about shepherds or I'm going to talk about pastors or I'm going to talk about leaders in a third person. It doesn't mean that it doesn't include us. It just means that some of you uh, listen to other pastors. Some of you listen to other teachers. Some of you may even belong uh, to another congregation. And so the question always becomes, how do I know I'm following a godly leader? How do I know that I have the right spiritual leaders uh, to obey, right? How do I know that I have uh, the right shepherds uh, to uh, imitate? And that's a good question. 
Okay, because you don't want to be led astray, right? We know that in the New Testament, we're, we're commanded not to follow those leaders who are corrupt, right? We don't follow uh, false teachers. But how do we know that we are following a godly teacher, elder, or pastor, right? And so what I want to look here is the verses that I gave you, but I want to keep it simple. We're just going to talk about basically six, six aspects of spiritual leadership to help you identify who you're following, who you're imitating, I just want to talk about the essentials, right, of a godly pastor or a shepherd or elder. And the first thing that I want you to notice here, if you're looking at verse 1, is that Christ has appointed godly shepherds to lead the church, that one of the means that Christ uses to shepherd his flock are going to be these godly leaders, right? And this word hegeomai, if you're, if you're looking at it, this word for leaders, right, it means to lead, to guide, or to rule or to govern. And the idea in the New Testament is that a godly leader does not lead simply because he feels adequate to lead, right? Or that, that he is a, always equipped to lead, but simply, right? Simply that he is willing, right? He is ready. He is able, right? To, uh, and desires to do uh, the will of God. That's what a godly leader is. The apostle Paul put it this way. Let me put it for you. I know some of this is technical and we'll get through it, but I want you to understand Paul says, therefore, I exalt, I exhort the elders. I'm sorry, this is Peter. Peter says, therefore, I, therefore, I exhort the elders, right? That's presbyteros in the original language, right? The word for elders, I exhort the elders among you uh, to shepherd. That's the word poimain. It just means shepherd, uh, the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, episkopos, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the what? The will of God and not for sordid gain. It means they're not in it for the money, okay? If I have to hear that one one more time, I'm thinking, yeah, go ahead and run with that one because about 90% of your spiritual leaders don't make a dime, okay? So that doesn't play too well, but it does with the world. They love that, right? All you want is money. Not according, or they do this for according to the will of God, not for sort of gain, and they do this uh, with eagerness, right? And I would add that the writer of Hebrews says in verse 17, if you're looking at it, he says, let them do this with joy and not with grief, right? That's, that's the goal here. And the godly leader's joy here, and I want you to get this right from the get-go so that you have an understanding, the godly leader's joy, my joy, okay, in leading the congregation is that you would love and obey Christ. That's the most joy I can possibly have, okay? It's not in how much praise you give me. I don't care about that, okay? Honestly, I want you to love and obey Christ. That's the most joy that any pastor can have. And I can tell you what the most grief is. The most grief is, is when you don't. Okay? Trust me. The most grief is when you don't. Because it's heartbreaking. Because ultimately, as the writer of Hebrews is going to tell us, it's unprofitable for what? Your soul. Okay? It's an eternal issue, isn't it? And so nobody wants to see that in the church. That a leader, right, a godly leader understands that the purpose of the church is to display Christ, right? He knows that the church belongs to Christ and that church is, uh, Christ is the head of the church and that Christ is the great shepherd. If you look at verse 20, right? The God of peace who brought up from the dead, what? The great shepherd. And that Christ promised to the church is that he's going to build this church and that the gates of Hades or hell will not stand against it. And so the whole point is, I can't hold back the gates of hell, okay? I can't do anything for your soul, okay? As a pastor, I can't do anything for your soul. I can't hold back the gates of hell, right? I cannot build the church. There's nothing I can do to build the church. All I can do as a godly leader is point you to the one who can. And that's my sole purpose in this life is to point you to Christ. That's the sole purpose of any godly leader, right? That is his hope and his passion uh, that he would lead uh, you to Christ. And so how does he do that, right? That's the whole point here. How does he do that? And the, and the, and the answer to that is that he does that by always pointing you to the word of God. Look at verse 7 with me. <clears throat> 
He says, remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, he says, imitate their faith. And so the primary responsibility of the godly pastor or shepherd or elder, right, is to teach and preach the word of God, right? That's his whole purpose. Or as Jesus puts it in John 21, which we'll look at in a minute, right, that we feed the flock. That's the whole point, okay? That's our only purpose is to feed the flock. And I know that I say this a lot, but it is imperative for you because I do get this question a lot. Look, if you're pastor, elder, teacher, right? The one that you're listening to, right? You have to ask yourself a few questions, right? Uh, Does he talk about himself or does he talk about Christ? Okay. Is he pointing you to his ministry or is he pointing you to the ministry uh, that Christ brought through his blood, right? That's the whole point. Uh, Is your shepherd's conversation always seasoned with the word of God or is it just a lot of good advice? Because I'm telling you right now, those things are important and those things are glaring, glaring, okay? Because his whole purpose, right, is to point you to Christ. Now, I know this is a little bit long, but I want you to show you something because Jesus makes it clear here that you're going to know what your shepherd loves by what he says, by what he speaks. This is Jesus talking to Peter. He says, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my lambs, right? Bosco, take care of those who come into the flock, those new and baby believers, man, and draw them in by the word of God, feed them, right? And then he says, Jesus said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, shepherd my sheep. There's the poimain again, right? Take care of those who are in your flock, right? Watch over them. Don't let them go astray. That's the whole point. And Jesus said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved, right? Because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Peter said to him, right, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said again, right, feed my sheep. It's not lambs anymore, right? It's those mature believers that he is to take care of. And so that is his sole purpose in the church. So a godly shepherd is always willing to lead you to Christ, lead you to Christ, right? Secondly, a godly leader is always willing to point you to the word of God. Thirdly, A godly leader is always willing to lead by example, okay? He's always willing to lead by example, right? Look at verse 7, that a godly leader recognizes or a godly shepherd recognizes that his role is not so much an official position as it is a ministry, right? That their desire is to be recognized by their work and their character and not so much by their position. That is the truth. Look what he says in verse 7. He says, remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, considering the result of their conduct, he says, imitate their faith. Now, contextually speaking, the idea here is that they are remembering leaders that are not with them anymore. Okay? Remember those guys that led you. Remember those guys that spoke the word. Remember those guys who used to be with us that aren't with us. You don't have to guess what happened to them. Okay, we're talking about the first century church that was being destroyed because they were preaching Christ, okay? He says, consider the result of their conduct. What was the result of their conduct? That they believed and trusted Christ all the way to the end, right? And he says, imitate their faith. Remember, a godly pastor or elder or overseer, right, is to see himself as a slave or a servant, That's the whole point. The New Testament uses two terms, right? Uses the word doulos. That's the word for slave, right? Or humperites, which is the the word for uh, an under rower, right? It's the word um, for a galley slave. Literally uh, means those slaves who were at the bottom of a ship who did, you know, who rowed the little oars. You guys have all seen the movies, right? That's what a godly leader is. He's a servant of all. And in relation to others, a godly leader sees himself as a servant and a minister, one who is willing to spend himself on the needs of others, right? The apostle Paul put it this way, right? I want you to look at this. 
Paul said, but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself so that I may finish my course and what? The ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify him solemnly. Notice what was Paul's primary goal of his ministry? He was to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. In other words, Paul's sole purpose in the ministry was what? To feed the sheep to speak the Word of God, to teach and preach uh, the Word of God. And again, this is all predicated on a Christ-like attitude. Understand this, okay? Pastors, teachers, elders, overseers, they are not infallible. They are not perfect. They make wrong decisions all the time. But what you're trusting in is not the man. What you're trusting in is the Christ in him. The Holy Spirit that is working in him. Hey, it's the same way with your marriage, folks. Okay? You understand this, right? Your your husband or your wife, and if you've been married, I don't know, longer than, it has to be like two years, right? First two years, you're kind of like. But things begin to creep up, right? Because we are all flawed. And so even in your marriage, you're going to have to begin to trust the Spirit of God in your spouse. Because that's the only thing that is working in your spouse. There's nothing you can do uh, to change their character or nature. Only Christ can do that. We talked about that. And so all of this, these godly leaders, these overseers, these elders, whichever word you want to use, this is all predicated on a Christ-like attitude and a servant's attitude, right? Remember, it was Jesus who said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so if the chief shepherd, right, the great shepherd has this kind of attitude, then how much more is under shepherds, okay? And understand, this is what you're looking for in a godly leader, okay? This is what you're, you're, and you should look for this. I wouldn't settle for anything else because if you do, it is not profitable for your soul. That's the whole point, Okay? There's nothing they can do for you if they're not a godly man, if they are not spirit-filled, spirit-led, right? If they are not teaching and preaching the Word of God. So what is the goal for a pastor, right, or a shepherd here uh, in this passage? What is it that a godly leader does for you that benefits you? Let's look at verse uh, 17. And you'll see the first thing is that a godly leader, a godly pastor, he keeps watch, it says, over your soul. Remember, his goal is to strengthen you and his goal is to cause you to endure. Look at verse 17. He says, obey your leaders and submit to them for they keep watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account, right? And remember, the greatest profit to your soul here, we've been talking about this since the beginning, is this perseverance and endurance. Remember, Jesus is the one that said that those who endure to the end will be saved. And we've talked about this verse so many times, but what he's saying is not because you endure that you'll be saved, it's because you're saved, right, that you will endure. It's the other way around. And so this is the whole point, right, that you would endure, that you would perseverance persevere. And so these leaders, right, they watch over, right, they keep watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. And this word watch here just simply means to be alert or to stay awake or to be on guard. Literally, right, if you're looking at the verse, that they would keep guard, right, on behalf of your souls for the sake of your souls, It means that godly leaders are to be diligent in all spiritual matters. Well, what spiritual matters are that? Well, that goes right back to to verse 7, doesn't it, right? That they are keeping watch, what? Over the Word of God. That they are always looking to Christ, right? And they are always uh, keeping a watch over their conduct, okay? Secondly, the spiritual leader uh, leads with soberness, right? First, he leads with watchfulness. Secondly, he leads with soberness. What are they sober about? Look at verse 17. He says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. And the idea here is that one day, right, everyone who is in the leadership of your church is going to have to stand before the throne of Christ, right? And they're going to have to give an account of what they did uh, with the flock, right? How they shepherded uh, the flock of God, right? What did they do with the word of God? What did they do with the name of Christ? What did they do? Uh, with the sheep that were given to them. I was talking about this last week with Richard and a couple of the other guys. Man, there's no way 
that a, a, a godly pastor or teacher desires to have 4,000 or 12,000 or 14,000 people, okay? I don't think we do too well with the 60 that we have. I don't want 4,000 to worry about because I'm going to have to give an account for every one of those souls before Christ. So I'm content, okay? It's not that I don't want the church to grow, but we have the responsibility to shepherd everyone who is under our charge. That's the whole point. So there is watchfulness, there is soberness, Lastly, there's joyfulness, okay? There's joyfulness, if you're looking at the verse, that a spiritual leader is to be joyful in their leading, okay? In other words, they love what they do, right? He says in verse seven, he says, let them, right, the leaders, do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. And the idea here is that the profitableness for you comes through the spiritual joy of the leader himself, Okay? That just makes sense. I mean, we even have that same paradigm in our families, right? If mom's happy, everybody's happy, okay? But look at it. There's two aspects, I think, here that we have to address, right? The first aspect that I see in this is that if you are always grieving your spiritual leaders through opposition and rebellion, eventually that's not going to be of any benefit to you. Do you understand? Okay. And the reason is, it's just naturally. Okay. It's not like it's some kind of uh, hidden meaning here. If you're always grieving and you're always in rebellion against those who lead you, the reason it's not going to be profitable for you is because your spiritual leader, pastor, elder, teacher, overseer, if he is standing under the word of God, in other words, uh, the word of God is at the top of the pile. You're not going to be in opposition to your pastor or teacher. You're going to be in opposition to who? Christ himself, aren't you? Okay, that's the whole point. That you will be in opposition to the Word of God, that you will be op- in opposition to Christ, right? This is why Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 10, right? The one who receives you receives me. Okay, that was important for them to understand. And the point is that this is an eternal issue, like I said. I mean, you cannot say that you receive the great shepherd and then reject those who are his under shepherds. Do you understand? There's no benefit for you. And like I said, this is all predicated on the fact that your spiritual leaders are standing up under the word of God. Remember, the only authority that I have over you is not by position. The only authority I have over you is the word of God, period. There's no pastor, teacher, elder, overseer who has authority over his flock. The only authority he has is the Word of God. That's why we preach and teach the Word of God. That's why we admonish uh, with the Word of God. That's why we encourage with the Word of God, right? If your spiritual leader is not encouraging, leading you, warning you from the Word of God, then there is no benefit for you, do you see? Because it's the Word of God that does the work in you. It's the Holy Spirit through the Word of God that does the work in you, not your pastor. I cannot change you. I cannot save your soul. But I can lead you to the one that can. I can point you to the one who can. The second aspect of this, right, this joyfulness that I see in this, uh, of a leader's joy is that, is that he delights in leading you to Christ through the Word of God, right? That he delights in Christ himself. If he doesn't delight in those things, then it's no profit for you, right? That just makes sense, right? If your spiritual leader does not delight in the Word of God, if he doesn't delight in the value of knowing Christ, if your spiritual leader uh, does not delight in his calling, then it's going to be unprofitable, right? In other words, if your spiritual leaders, if your pastors, if your elders do not see the value of knowing Christ in his Word, then why should anybody they lead believe it? Why would they see the value of knowing Christ in his word? And believe me, this is prevalent out there, folks. You got guys out there calling themselves shepherd of the sheep who are not willing to speak the word of God out of fear or for whatever reason. I don't know. And so all of their conversations uh, are not pointing you to Christ. They're really just good advice. And I don't know about you, but good advice doesn't do you any good eternally. 
one of the things I've been studying and I've been thinking about this. If you want to look at this, turn to Ephesians chapter 3. We'll read this real quick here. I love this because such great examples in the New Testament. One of them is Paul. Paul was a, a, a shepherd who, who saw the value of knowing Christ, who saw the value of God's word, right? Who believed and trusted in Christ. And so I want to show you this. I've been studying the, pr- the prayers of Paul in the New Testament, uh, primarily because I want to pray like that, you know? Uh, if I'm to imitate my shepherd's walk, imitate their faith, then I would want to know these things. And so we see in this, look at, these, uh, look at this prayer here to help you out with this. Paul wasn't about making you feel better about yourself. He wasn't about building up your self-esteem, okay? Uh, he wasn't about making much of you. He was always about making much of Christ. And why would he do that? Because he knew that it was the greatest benefit for you. That if Paul loved and valued Christ and his word, that you would know and value Christ in his word. That was the whole point. Look what he says, chapter three, verse seven. He says, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all the saints, notice his attitude about himself. To me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. That's what his life was all about. That's what he did. He loved Christ. He knew the value of knowing Christ. He knew the value of his salvation. He knew the value of the word. He said, I'm the least of all the apostles. The guy who wrote 13 books in the New Testament more than any other apostle. He says, I was the least of these. He says, but my whole job was to preach to you the unfathomable riches of Christ. He says, now drop down to verse 14. Listen to this prayer, okay? He says, for this reason, he says, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, that's you and me, right? That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be what? To be strengthened with power. Do you see it? That's his whole purpose. He wants you to be strengthened. How does he want you to be strengthened? He wants you to be strengthened through what? The word of God. He says, strengthened with power through his spirit, right? The spirit of God in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up with the fullness of God. Fantastic, fantastic. This is how a shepherd leads his people. He's always pointing them to Christ. So the only question that remains in our passage is why are we commanded to obey our leaders, right? Why are we commanded to imitate their faith? It's not because they're infallible, okay? It's not because they make all the right decisions. It's because it will be profitable for you. It will be profitable for you, right? Because they're leading you to Jesus Christ, the one who is infallible. They are leading you to Jesus Christ, uh, who is perfect. They are leading you to Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, right? Today and what? Forever. That's what he says. But look at verse 20. I want you to see this. Because the promise here is, right? The promise here is if you have a godly shepherd, right? You have a godly teacher. You have a godly elder. You have a godly overseer. You got one who stands up under the word of God and is dedicated and, and, and pointed to constantly be pointing you, constantly to be presenting Christ to you. If you have that guy uh, in your congregation, if you have that guy in your church, if you have that guy out there in the world that you're listening to, then the promise here in verse 20 is that it is Christ himself who was working through that under shepherd to profit you, to work in you. Listen to what he says. He says, now the God of peace, right? 
who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord. May he equip you in every good thing to do his will, right? Working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so what does a godly leader look like, right? He's one who is watching over your soul. He's one that's constantly going to be pointing you to the word of God. He's constantly going to be presenting Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your words today. Um, praying uh, literally uh, out loud this morning for uh, the leadership of this particular congregation, Father God, that we would continue uh, to hold this standard um, not, of course, by our will, Father God, but by the, the, the will of God and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God working through us as well. That we are being uh, built up, that we are being um, strengthened, that we are uh, enduring, Father, uh, as we uh, lead others to do the same. Uh, we pray for our congregation, Father, that we would be uh, submissive to our leadership, Father God, understanding that Christ is working through them uh, through the Holy Spirit, Father God, that uh, we can be assured and we can be confident that even though uh, our leaders are flawed, Father God, that Christ is not, and that he will work all things according to his will, that he will do everything in us that is pleasing in his sight. What a great verse that is. And so we thank you. Um, and I just pray this morning that, like the writer of Hebrews says, that the fruit of our lips will be this praise and thankfulness towards God for all of these things. We love you, Jesus, and we pray all these precious things in your name. Amen.